Psalm 34 verse 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. It says he delivers from all of our fears. Imagine the impact that people could have if they really lived completely fearless, free from all of our fears. What things would you be willing to attempt? What things would you be willing to put your hand to? What wouldn't you be willing to do if you were completely free from all of your fears? You know, sometimes when you talk this way about being free from fear, serving Jesus, completely absent of what other people are subjected to, there will be pushback from people who will say things like, listen, just because you're a believer, just because you're a Christian, doesn't mean that your life is gonna be trial free, obstacle free. They'll push back against the idea of living life free from all fears. But when people talk like that, that kind of mindset really just reveals that there's a lack of understanding for the way that God provides. That they think being fearless is just based on circumstances, but that's not the case. Of course we have trials. Of course we have obstacles. Of course we have difficulties. But there's the ability God provides to be in the middle of those difficulties, but not be subjected from fear that would naturally be associated with those difficulties. God gives us a spirit of boldness, a spirit of power, so that we don't have to operate like regular people operate that you can be in the middle of a situation that would normally cause fear, cause dread, cause panic, cause anxiety, but all of those things are absent from you because of the spirit of boldness that God's put on the inside of you. The Bible says God gives us a peace that goes beyond understanding. Some people don't understand that you can be fearless and it's not just based on when situations are conducive and going the way you want them to go. When you think about it, being fearless when there's nothing to fear isn't really impressive anyway. It's impressive when God gives us the ability to be fearless in a fearful situation and that's exactly what he wants for all of his children. You know, we talked last time about Psalm 23. It says, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, I will fear no evil or I won't be afraid. That's in the, the valley of the shadow of death. Not, not the valley of the shadow of smiles and rainbows and things are, things are going well. It's in the valley of the shadow of death. In that situation, in that circumstance, you can be free from all of your fears. You know, when you read the first couple of chapters of the book of Joshua, Joshua is getting ready to take over leading the people of Israel, which in the natural would be a very frightening thing to do, to be put in charge, to be the leader of millions of people. That could be frightening on its own. But it wasn't just leading the people. Joshua was to lead God's people into the promised land. So it was going into a season of war, a season of battles. So in the natural, there was a lot of reason to be afraid. But God tells Joshua over and over and over again, do not be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled. Have a boldness, have a confidence going into war, going into a situation that would be scary, a situation that would involve trial. But God wanted Joshua to be in that scary situation and to be completely fearless in the midst of it. I started off by reading from Psalm 34. If we would have read later into that chapter, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. So thinking being fearless is the equivalent of just smooth sailing and no trials. People that, that try to discount the opportunity for a believer to live life free from fear, based on that, they don't understand the way that God provides boldness and peace in the midst of trials and difficulties. Yes, there are, the afflictions of the righteous can be many, but in the middle of those battles, God gives victory. When you come up against those obstacles, God gives the strength to overcome. When you encounter trials, God gives you the ability to walk through it successfully every time. And that's why we can be fearless. It's not smooth sailing, no trouble. It's when you meet trouble, you've got what it takes to come out the other side victorious. And that's why you don't have to live in dread and fear. You can live with hope and peace and joy, looking forward to those difficulties because that's when you get to prove that you are an overcomer. In part one, we looked at the root of fear. 
We looked at Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, and the first time anyone ever felt fear. He said, I hid from you, Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, I hid because I, I was afraid. So the first time anyone ever felt fear, it was because there was an expectation of punishment based in sin. So fear has its roots in sin. We talked about what you are expecting determines whether you are afraid or not. So what are you expecting and what are those expectations based on? We talked about the importance of having your expectations tied not to what you've done and what you deserve, but the importance of understanding what Jesus has accomplished, understanding the blood of Jesus and how you are no longer a sinner, but you're the righteousness of God in Christ. So instead of anticipating judgment, instead of anticipating bad things are coming my way, knowing that the blessing of God is coming your way, that goodness and mercy are pursuing you, and having that as your focus, your focus, your eyes on Jesus, understanding what he's accomplished, the price that's been paid for you, gives you the ability to be fearless. So the source of fear ultimately is sin, and the result of sin is death, and death is what gives fear its strength. Fear and death are closely related. They, they both originate from the same place. They both have their origination in sin. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 5, verse 12. It says this, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Sin brought death. Do you realize what kind of impact a fear of death has on people. How much a fear of death influences the way that people live their lives. Because people have a fear of death, they cling to this world. But this world is temporary. And this life is temporary. Sooner or later, these bodies will wear out. And unless Jesus comes back during our lifetime, all of us are going to die. Given a long enough sample period, the death rate is always 100%. All of us, again, unless Jesus returns, all of us are going to die. And this world is temporary. So we're temporary. This world is temporary. So people will cling to this life and cling to this world. You see it in so many different ways. Sometimes it looks like people pursuing pleasure, that that's the main pursuit of their life whether it's sexual pleasure or different addictions, drugs, and alcohol. Sometimes you'll see people, a fear of death and them clinging to this life manifest by the way that they pursue material things and trying to get their hands on possessions. Sometimes it might look like people vying for power and influence, but all of it is temporary. All of it is passing away. So really, it's foolishness for people to try to find their security in things that are fleeting and temporary. It's foolishness for people to find security in a place that has no security to offer. But that's the mistake that so many people live. They live their life pursuing something, trying to acquire something that cannot be acquired, and it's futility trying to get security in things that are temporary. This life in the natural is temporary, and this world is temporary. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. According to that passage, who had the power of death? It says, to destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. The devil is the one who had, past tense, had the power of death. So, death is not of God. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that death is the last enemy of God to be destroyed. So death is an enemy of God, and God is an enemy of death. It was never God's intention for people to die, but it's a result of sin. The devil is the originator of death. But Jesus came so that he could release people from that fear. 
that that fear that, that bound them, that fear that held them subjected, that fear that controlled them, they could be free. They could be released. So for those of us who know Jesus, there's been a release. We are free from that fear. So for somebody who has a relationship with Jesus, there is no need for them to be afraid of dying. The Apostle Paul had that figured out. He even struggled with which one he desired more, whether to stay in this life or go home to be with the Lord. He said, for me to live is Christ, but to die, it's gain. If I stay alive, I can continue to serve people. I can continue to advance the kingdom of God. But on the other hand, if I die, that's not a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing. If you know Jesus, the fear of death, you, you don't have to be subjected to it anymore. In fact, that passage said that the reason Jesus came was to set you free from that bondage that would control you all of your life if you allow it to, but you don't have to, to release you from a fear of death. I can't say this from personal experience, but I suspect that the only reason a believer would be afraid to die is simply because they've never done it before. That if there was a way for us to talk to a, someone who's died and gone to heaven and say, hey, listen, is, is this something I should be afraid of? That they'd say, absolutely not. That it's the most wonderful thing they've ever experienced to step out of this old temporary body and into the presence of God, that it's wonderful to meet Jesus face to face. For a believer, death holds no more fear. It's nothing to be live in dread of. It's something to look forward to look forward to. much fear is related to a fear of dying physically, but that's not really the entire extent of it, because death doesn't just mean when your heart stops and this physical body dies. The meaning of death really has to do with separation. You and I aren't just physical beings. Ultimately, you are a spiritual being. So when this body wears out and dies, you don't cease to exist. Every one of us will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. So the meaning of death is separation. Physically, when you die, it's just your spirit is separating from your body. But other things can experience death as well. Other things can experience separation. Death can come to a business. Death can come to a relationship. It just means an end of something or a separation. So a fear of death can affect every area of your life. A fear of death will limit you. It will keep you in slavery. And that's what this passage is saying, that Jesus came to release us from a fear of death that held people in captivities all of your life. When you allow a fear of death, whether it's the death of a relationship, the death of a business, the death of an opportunity, the end of something, that those things will keep you in slavery. That passage tells us how Jesus was going to set us free. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Through death he might destroy him. So how is Jesus going to release us from that fear? How was it that Jesus says is going to set us free? Not from something that we're looking forward to him doing, hoping that he'll do, but through death, he might destroy the one who had the power of death. Jesus already died on the cross. So that means that freedom from fear, the ability to be fearless, has already been provided. In some ways, fear and faith have similarities. As you read through the Bible, you'll see Jesus encounter people who had a little bit of faith and some people who had great faith. The same way, there are some people who have great fear, and some people who have small amounts of fear. But for the person that knows Jesus, we're not to have a small amount of fear, but to be fearless. No fear in our lives. But if you're like me, there are times where you're tempted to be afraid, where you feel fear creeping up. You start to sense 
a worry, an anxiety, a dread coming over you. So what do we do in those situations? I want to read to you something Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Jesus told his disciples, and it applies to you and I, that he was leaving us his peace, giving his peace to us. Now when somebody gives you something, that means that ownership is transferred, that it now belongs to you. It's your peace. If Jesus has given us his peace, that means it's ours. It's, it belongs to us. But once ownership is transferred, then the responsibility of taking possession, the responsibility of operating, comes to the person who now owns it. Let's say you gave somebody a vehicle that you signed the title over to them. You gave them the keys and you said, I want you to have this vehicle. From that point forward, who's responsible for that vehicle? Who's responsible to either operate it or not operate it? It's the person who received possession of it. And it's the same way with the peace that Jesus has given us. He said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. But then he also said, I give my peace not as the world gives. The world's peace is completely controlled by situations and circumstances. If things are going well, then peace might be obtainable for people. But it is completely determined by a situation. Jesus said, my peace, my peace doesn't work that way. My peace isn't limited to situations and circumstances. So when people only have an understanding of peace based on whatever trial I'm in the middle of, whatever thing is intimidating me, whatever thing is causing me fear, it needs to be removed from my life and I just have smooth sailing. They're not understanding the way Jesus' peace works. He says, my peace, my peace doesn't operate the way that the world's peace operates. So when you go to him and say, boy, I need your peace, but you're expecting the world's peace, you can find yourself disappointed. It's a peace that doesn't necessarily always remove the circumstance, but gives you the ability to be in the middle of that circumstance free from all fear. In Mark chapter 4 is the story of Jesus and his disciples getting in a boat to head across the Sea of Galilee. While they're on their way across, Jesus falls asleep in the back of the boat. He's taking a nap, and while he's sleeping, a storm develops, and it actually gets bad enough where the disciples think that they're going to sink. The boat's being tossed around, Waves are coming over the side of the boat, and the disciples end up waking Jesus up, yelling, Master, don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you care that we're going to perish? Jesus got up from his nap. He rebuked the wind and the waves, and everything became peaceful. And his disciples said, Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? When do you think the disciples got peace? In the middle of that storm, they had no peace. They only had peace when the wind stopped, when the waves stopped, when everything was smooth sailing. But what about Jesus? When did he have peace? Jesus had peace through the entire situation. When they got in the boat, Jesus had peace. When Jesus looked at the horizon and he could tell that there was a storm coming, he had peace. He went ahead and laid down for a nap. When the storm was raging and the boat was being tossed and waves were coming over the side of the boat and mist was hitting him in the face, he was asleep, probably with a smile on his face. He had peace. When his disciples woke him up screaming, don't you care that we're going to die? He had peace. When he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, he had peace. It didn't matter what was going on around him. He had peace through the entire circumstance. Whatever was happening, Jesus' peace was consistent. And he said, that's the peace that I'm leaving you. His disciples didn't have it at that point. He hadn't given them his peace yet. So their peace was determined by situations. But he said, this is the kind of peace that I want you to have. I'm giving you my peace. And then he said, don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So you and I have a responsibility, because we own peace, to operate it, to take possession of it. 
In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' disciples ask him about the end of the age or the last days, and Jesus begins to tell them what they can expect. In verse 6, as he's beginning to talk about the end times, Jesus says this, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. See to it that you're not terrified. See to it that you don't get into a sense of panic or give in to fear. When he says see to it, that puts the responsibility on the, the disciples to make sure that they don't get into alarm or fear. If tomorrow morning you went to work and your boss gave you a list of things to do and then said, and I want you to see to it that these reports make it on my desk by the end of the day. When he says see to it, it elevates that task above all of the other tasks. I want you to get all this stuff done, but I want you to see to it that you get this done especially. So when Jesus says, see to it, he is elevating that task above others, and he says, see to it that you don't let your hearts be alarmed. It's important that we guard our hearts and take the responsibility that's ours, not just to see if, boy, see if I have peace or not, it's been turned over to you and me. Jesus gave us his peace, and then he told us, see to it, make sure, get it done. Don't let your heart be afraid. A few verses later, in verse 13, he says, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When he's telling his disciples not to be afraid, that's not just comforting words, trying to, to calm their fears and rub their tummy and tell them, listen, it'd be nice if you didn't have to be afraid. It's important. There's things riding on it. He says, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. If we jump back to John chapter 14, when Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, don't let your hearts be troubled. That word trouble means to be stirred up or to be in motion. In fact, it's the same word that's used in John chapter 5 where they were at the pool of Bethesda and people would gather around, all kinds of sick and paralyzed, lame people gathered around this pool. And it said that an angel would come and stir the waters, cause the waters to move, and the first one to get in would be healed. That word that's describing the stirring of the waters or, or the waters beginning to move is the same word that Jesus used in the Greek in John chapter 14, where he said, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be stirred. Don't let it be wishy-washy and, and be, be swayed one way or the other. So when Jesus says, the one who stands firm, the one who's not tossed back and forth, that's the person who stands firm to the end that will be saved. There is a lot riding on you and I keeping ourselves free from all fear and not allowing fear to become a, tr a controlling force in our lives. So I want to give you quickly just a few practical ways that we can take possession of the peace that Jesus gave us and make sure that when we do feel that temptation to be afraid, when fear does start to creep into our lives, how do we handle it? How do we deal with those situations? I said earlier that fear and faith have similarities. One of those similarities is the way that you build them or increase them. To increase your faith, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. So you can build up your faith by reading the Word of God, listening to the Word of God, hearing the Word preached, thinking, meditating on the Word of God. You can increase your faith. Well, fear operates much the same way, that you can build or increase fear in your life by what you think about, what you listen to, the things that you watch, what's going on in your heart, what's going on in your mind. So what, what is it that you're thinking about? What have you set your mind on? Because it'll either build your faith or build your fear. In Psalm 34, the first few verses, it says to magnify the Lord, to focus in on his goodness, to set your heart and your mind on how faithful he is, how wonderful he is, how holy he is. So instead of fixing your mind on whatever is intimidating you, whatever's causing fear, instead shift your focus not on the diagnosis, not on the debt, not on the person that's giving you a hard time or whatever trial, whatever's stirring up fear or threatening to cause you to get into fear, and shift your mind and your focus to how faithful God is, how he's been, a, what a provider he is, how he's a healer, and set your mind on the Lord. 
In Psalm 23, when it says, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. That word in the Hebrew for fear literally means to stand in awe of or to be reverent of. So when you're in fear of something, you're actually standing in awe of something. When you're afraid of cancer, afraid of sickness, what's essentially happening is that you're thinking of how great, how powerful that thing is to stand in awe, to be reverent of it. So when you understand fear in that way, then when the Bible tells us to fear the Lord, it makes more sense. It's not saying to be afraid of Him, but to stand in awe and to be reverent of Him. So it's a mistake for a believer to begin to stand in awe and to be reverent of whatever it is that's threatening them to, be, to become afraid. To be reverent and in awe of a debt, to be in awe and reverent of a bill, a diagnosis, something going on politically, something going on in whatever area of your life, that we've got to have a determination in our hearts that our awe, our reverence belongs to the Lord and to Him alone, that I'm not going to stand in awe of anything the enemy's trying to intimidate me with. I'm not going to give reverence and respect to anything. All of it belongs to the Lord. So standing in awe of something other than the Lord really runs parallel with idolatry. So we've got to guard our hearts against that. In James chapter 4, verse 7, it says to resist the devil and he'll flee. So that's another practical step. When you feel fear creeping up in your life, not to be passive about it, but to actively resist it. That word is not describing someone just being passive, aggressive, trying to ignore a situation. It means to powerfully oppose, to push back against. So when the enemy's trying to pull you into fear or to, to drive you into a state of being afraid, you don't just ignore it and hope it goes away. You've got to make up your mind, I'm not going to allow myself to move in that direction. I absolutely refuse to stand in awe of wh whatever it happens to be. That you begin to focus your heart on the Lord, you magnify the Lord, and you direct your attention that way. In Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 26, it says to be angry and sin not. That verse is talking about when people feel angry and you feel angry from time to time, that you need to get rid of that feeling of anger. In fact, later on it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. So when you're dealing with feelings of anger, you need to get your heart right and get rid of those feelings. But in the meantime, make sure that you don't sin. Don't act on those feelings. We can apply that same principle to fear. There might be times where you start to feel afraid, feelings of anxiety and worry might begin to come, and you need to, again, fix your mind on the right things and get rid of them. But the problem is when people begin to act on, the, on that fear. Even when you feel afraid or you have certain things that might start to cause anxiety, make sure that you don't act, don't give in to them, don't yield to them, and don't make decisions or, or behavior based on those feelings. Let me give you one more practical step that can help you when you're starting to feel tempted with fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. That's what we talked about in part one. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. There's no fear in love because love drives out, love repels, love casts out fear. So earlier in that same chapter, it tells us that God is love. So one of the things that you can do when you feel fear creeping into your life is just to begin to think about God's love for you. Maybe you're at work or with friends and you feel fear creeping up. Even if you've got to excuse yourself and just get alone for a few minutes and begin to focus your heart on how much God loves you, begin to press in in fellowship with the Lord, lift your hands, just begin to thank God that His love for you is so deep and so high and so wide that you'll never fully compromise comprehend just how strong his love is for you, that there's nothing that could ever separate you from his love. Just begin to praise him, thank him, even if you don't feel like feel it at the moment. Father, I thank you that your love for me is deep. Father, I thank you that you'll never stop loving me. And allow the love of God to become more and more real. Set your mind on God's love for you, because that passage tells us what love does in someone's life 
is it casts out, it removes fear. The more confident, the more aware you are of God's love, the less fear has an opportunity to operate in your life. So a few practical things that we can do when you do start to feel fear creeping in your life. Careful of what you set your mind on. Don't magnify the problem, magnify the Lord. Make up your mind that you're not going to stand in awe and be reverent of that circumstance, of that diagnosis. Again, whatever it is that's threatening fear in your life, I, I refuse to stand in awe of it. My awe and reverence belongs to the Lord. I'm going to resist the devil, and I know that he'll flee from me when I actively resist him. I'm not going to go the direction he wants me to go. I'm going to begin to move in the opposite direction, and I'm going to press in and become more aware of God's love for me. Jesus said, his own personal peace belongs to you, but you've got to take possession of it. You have a responsibility to not let your heart be troubled, not to be afraid, to maintain that you are fearless.